yesterday in the UK in a, a, a food factory. Before I get on to the, um, on to the case study, uh, just a small bit about Nye House Industries. You've probably seen the, the stand just as you come in the main entrance. But the mission statement for Nye House is, is to, to produce sustainable solutions for the water, the cyclic water economy. And as a consequence of that, Nye House acquired DBUK, who specialise in, in cooling water process, both in terms of water chemistries, water engineering, specifically of cooling towers. So this only happened very recently in September, but this case study is from a year or so ago. Um, and uh, the remit really is to, is to control all the legislative and process um, requirements of the cooling system. So challenges in the cooling water in the UK, and this, this is also what was driving our project for the, the case study. Water costs are increasing all the time, and in the UK, uh, Towns Mains water can be well over two pounds a cubic metre, so there's a, a big drive in terms of water reduction. Uh, from a Legionella perspective for cooling towers, there's a big legislative framework. In the UK, it's ACOP L8, it's a, a legal document, and this is what all cooling tower operators are, are working to in terms of controls of Legionella. Increasing discharge costs, so particularly Mogden is used to calculate discharge, uh, costs for discharge and there's also a lot of volume restrictions nowadays. And then of course there's process challenges for any, any industrial facility to make more products, increase efficiency, reduce costs and lastly to minimise plant downtime. Uh, and maintenance. And all of these things were driving the pro project, particularly the Legionella part, because in the particular cooling tower, it's a, on a food factory uh, which has a lot of canning and bottling facilities, and the contamination was coming from fat soils and greases, and it was accumulating in the system and causing biofouling, biofilms were forming, and as a consequence, the, the bromine dosing was very sporadic, up and down, and correspondingly, the microbiology results was, was up and down as well. The fouling was causing issues in terms of um, downtime maintenance, heat transfer problems, uh, and, and, the, and the system had to be cleaned on a regular basis as well. So all these things transpired to, to give a headache to the plant operators. So as a start, we, we looked at the disinfection side of the, of the, of the issue, uh, because the, the disinfectant levels were very erratic, so we looked at some uh, looked at the market for ozone, chlorine dioxide, electrochemical. Uh, we already had traditional bromine dosing in place and ionisation we looked at as well. The issue with, with most of those technologies is that there's a lot of capex involved, certainly in ozone, uh, chlorine dioxide, electrochemical, there's big investments. So therefore it's, it has to go into some sort of capex budget for the future. We then got to filtration because of the fouling issue. And again, there's lots of options available, membrane, we looked at screen and bag filtration, and centrifugal filtration as well. So we looked at all the options and came up with, with um, a strategy. So these were the, the KPIs, uh, the, the, the challenges for the, which I've already mentioned. The main issue was organic solids and, and, and COD, which meant that there was a build-up of sludge in the system, and they were excessively purging the cooling tower uh, to keep that COD down and, uh, and keep the bacteria under control. So in the end, it was limited capex which almost made the decision for us. They needed a quick solution. Um, it's external auditors are demanding that, that there was a change in, in, in the strategy. So we introduced the bioorganic catalyst to, to the customer. This is a liquid formulation. Um, it's easily applied at just a simple dosing pump. It's non-toxic and safe for operators. So again, it's got a good posh profile in terms of uh, as it. It's biodegradable, it's green technology. It's cost effective because of the very low dosages that you, that you use and it's very persistent in the system. So it's used anywhere where there's a high organic loading on, on the system and this was a perfect match for the, for the technology. So how does it work? It solubilizes suspended organic material, first of all, the surfactants and, and short-chain proteins that allow us to do this. 
and it basically has a catalyst in it, expect from a catalyst, it lowers the hydrolysis activation energy, so it starts to break down those solubilized organic molecules, and it's not substrate dependent, it doesn't matter whether, what the contamination is, it works on those carbon to carbon bonds and starts to, and starts to break down. Also aids the aeration of the system by forming micro bubbles, and this obviously helps in the hydrolysis process, particularly in the cooling tower where there's uh, heavy aeration of the water anywhere. And the product regenerates, so it carries on, and it's very, very persistent in the system. So once it's done the reaction once, it can go around and, and do it again. So really you're really topping the chemistry up in terms of system losses. So these are, back to the specific case study, these are some photographs. Um, and this is a, a buffer tank from the system, and you see the photograph on the left is heavy organic contamination, and there's probably about three or four centimetres of, of sludge in the bottom of that tank. And the issue with that was it went very anaerobic under the sludge, and it was causing Legionella and other bacteria to hide out in that sludge, which was recontaminating the system. Once we treated with BOC, very, very quickly, you can see on the right-hand photograph, the organic contamination was gone, solubilised, discharged. The, the stuff you can see there is really airborne particulates, so it's just silt and, and dust that's dragged out of the air. The next photographs are from the pack, the infill pack in the cooling tower, and again the left-hand side, you can probably just make out on the top the, the slime and organic debris that was accumulating in the pack. This is, this is pre-trial. Post-trial, we did some endoscopic photographs of, of the same pack in, in roughly the same position in the cooling tower. And you can see, again, the lack of slime and biofilm buildup, which was, which was great in terms of the, the, the controlling of the, uh, the bacterial levels. This is just a picture of the sump, uh, one of the sumps in the cooling tower. Again, left-hand side is pre-trial. That's a typical amount of, of sludge. You could smell it when you opened the cooling tower, it was particularly sort of rancid smell. On the right hand side, far, far less. We, we estimated there's probably about 95% less organic material in the, in, the, in the cooling system. So over, we had a three month trial, and over the three months, um, we, we managed to install the kit in a day, which is just linking in a dosing pump into a proportional system, so it's a flow based dosing system. Very, very small capex, just a thousand pounds for a simple dosing pump that you link and give a signal from the, the dosing controller. We found quantitatively there's a 95% reduction in, in organic and sludge levels. But the major benefit though was the disinfection, level, the concentration was maintained with less chemicals because there was less organic reaction with organics in the system. And more importantly, the bacteria corresponding bacterial control was much better. So from a compliance point of view, and Legionella and Rick's point of view, it was, a, it was a big win. They didn't have to purge water from the system unnecessarily, so we could cycle up and be talking about cycles of concentration. We weren't allowed to do that because the COD was so high pre-trial. Pre During the trial, we managed to really trim that blow down and cycle up the concentration of the cooling tower with a result in water consumption, uh, reduction in water consumption of about 40%. And the turnaround in terms of downtime for cleaning and, and uh, breakdowns was about 50% less during the, during the period. And majorly, a big one, which is probably unquantifiable, but a big issue is Legionella control, and it was far more stable. So we, we did an annualised ROI cost, so for every pound you spend on the BOC, the bioorganic catalyst, roughly resulted in about £4.30 worth of cost reduction for the client. So a good return on investment, and a very, very simple and elegant solution for the, for, for the problem. So some conclusions that we, we learned, we, we had to consider the whole, the whole story, both from a legislative, legionella point of view, from a process point of view, um, the issues, uh, the biofilms were calling, causing cooling time, increases in cooling time for the production. So it was restricting the amount of, of, of canning and bottling that the plant could do, and it was creating a real bottleneck. So that was a capacity issue, and also discharge uh, in terms of the amount of sludge we were getting from the system, and also the quality of water that was being discharged to, to, to the effluent plant. 
So we managed to crack all of these and we're still using the products 18 months later, still the same results uh, with very, very, very long lasting effects. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Can we have a hand? We'll come to the first question, Hector. Um, my question is, did you find other bacteria as well in the, in the cooling systems, in pipes? And have you found this Leonella in uh, other, uh, let's say, sites of other countries, or is it just specific for one? Um, in this particular case, what we found initially was, when the system was being cleaned up, that actually it was more difficult difficult to control general bacteria. We seem to get rid of all the biofilm and that uncovered a whole host of additional things, pseudomonas and, and lots of exotic exotic bacteria. After three days, once the biofilm had gone, the control was, was, was much better in terms of just general bacteria. So initially you got an increase in bacteria, but then your situation became under control. And, and we managed the client's expectations. Like we knew that this would this, this would happen, and, and they, they were expecting that. So what we did was, for the initial three to four days, we just raised the, the bromine and disinfectant levels, because we knew that, that the, the, the COV would effectively spike and then drop down again. Other questions from the audience? I see a question there. Do you use chlorine on the system, the system? Chlorine. Yeah. We use chlorine. chlorine. Yeah. In this particular case, this this. This is the So, I think the question was: Do we use chlorine in the system? What, yeah, what levels? What level of concentration do we use? Yeah. In, in the UK, one to two ppm of total oxidant uh, in the cooling tower. And, and not point, a minimum of 0.5 percent free oxygen. So, in this particular case, because the pH of the system is is around about nine, we use bromine because the the available oxygen is better. You know, in more industrial cooling towers, particularly power, you probably use chlorine because you can control the pH a lot lower. But the, the net effect is the same. You still need that residual of, of one to two ppm. Final pH. The final pH, pH of this particular system is around about 8.8. .8. Will the pH drop after your bromine treatment or does it increase? No, actually what happened was the, the, the pH before the trial was about 8.6 and because we were increasing the cycles of conductivity, you know, the cycles of, of concentration and the alkalinity was rising, we ended up 8.8, 8.99. So it was actually going up, in which case we needed to, to, to keep with the bromine technology. Okay, are there more questions from the audience? Is there a question here? The first question is if your chemical is affected by pH, and the second one is uh, if it uh, works as biodispersant, because you, you are, you, I understand you, in any case, use oxidant together with your uh, chemical. So it is the case that uh, I, I can consider as a pure dispersant or, uh, or not. So the first question was um, first question was pH. So the pH range of the you know normal enzymatic technologies are very specific on, on pH, whereas this catalyst works on a on a broad pH down from two right up to ten pH. So it's very effective. Um, it's, there's a sweet spot, but it's no problem with, 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 with being at pH 9. And also, it's, it's halogen stable as well. So the fact that we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 ppm of, of halogen there is, is not, it doesn't affect the effectiveness of the, of the product. Um, so The other question was, uh, is it the bias effectant, the type of working, or is there another working mechanism? Well, it's, it's a combination really. So there's the there's the solubilization which breaks down the, 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 the biofilm. So I guess yes, it's a it's a surfactant in that that respect. But it's the actual breaking down of those you know organic molecules that's that's the, the key differentiator for this product. 
So it doesn't just disperse it from A to B, it starts to break it down so that you're actually reducing the COD as well. Okay, I don't want questions. Maybe here. Sounds like it's a kind of biocide because it kills the organics, the cell structure of the biofilm. Can you confirm this? It, it's not. It's not biocide. Um, not at all. Not no, not biocide. Biocide. So there's no, there's no biocidal effect on, on the product. So it's really working by removing the, the. In fact, it works better with bacteria. Obviously, in a cooling tower, you, you're restricting the bacteria, but in a in a municipal wastewater stream or industrial wastewater stream where you've got a biological process, actually it helps it helps that process because you're solubilizing the food source for the making it more available for the bacteria. So it's it's definitely not a biocide. So when you remove the biofilm with the catalyst, your bacteria are still alive in the system because you, you Yeah, that's why you use it in conjunction with, with a with, with, yeah. Yeah, it's, it comes from it comes from the states. It's a patented product and it's regi registered for use all over the world. And, and do you have other applications for this catalyst that you use before? And any 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 place where you've got an unwanted organic load or you want to reduce, you know, organic contamination. So we use it effectively in municipal market, uh, in, in industrial wastewater, anaerobic digestion, odor control. You know, anywhere where the you know, huge, huge markets and uh, a potential paper, pulp, pulp and paper is another big market. Okay. Are there other questions? There was a question there. This is good. So, to thank you for your presentation. It seems that the, these compounds have a lot of quality, but do you see any drawback or any limitation in application as well? Maybe not for this specific application, but maybe in other applications. I think, I think the, the major drawback, if I'm, if I'm absolutely honest, is that if you've got a chemical technology, everybody's very, very sceptical of, of a chemical technology. And we have a term in the UK calling it snake oil. So people are, are sort of very, very reluctant to, to try it. But what we've, what we've done in all cases, uh, in all applications, is we've built up a, a return on investment case, either by doing pilot plant studies or, or trial work. And, and you overcome that, that hurdle of, you're not selling a piece of kit that you stick in like the other presentations where you can see physical results straight away, it's actually working you know, on a microscopic level. So I don't know whether that answers your question. But but no, not really. I think I think wherever we've used it we've got good results and the ROI is demonstrable almost immediately. So you know, you're getting getting from two pounds to, to pound extent up to in this case over four pounds. Okay, last question. Here we go. Yeah, I have a question around the uh, foaming tendency. So we're looking at a uh, bio detergent like substance. We're breaking down molecules and we're introducing micro bubbles. Uh, would we need to consider to do some anti foam at the same time? It's an excellent question, and it's what, what I what I was very fearful of on starting this trial because I thought by introducing this to the system we'd have foam coming out of the top of the cooling towers and whatnot. So yes, we did have an anti-foam on standby. But we started off, the dose rate of this product is very, very small. We were looking at between the one to five ppm range. Um, and we started off very low, uh, just to make sure we didn't have any foaming issues. And there was a, a certain amount of foaming in some of the tanks and, and, and buffer tanks, but. There was nothing that was causing a, a cavitation of pumps or process issues, and B, which would have been a disaster, something coming out of the out of the, the, the top of the cooling tower. So we started off very very slowly with the with the dose rate and built it up, and we found a sweet spot around two to three ppm in this case, which wasn't enough really to for, to, 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 to to have a foaming issue. We use it we use it on uh, ornamental fountains where you've got a lot of water cascading outside and again we don't get any issues with, uh, in that environment because the dose rate is, is very, very low. Okay, thank you. Can I have a hand? Thank you. Then I thank you all for your attention for uh, visiting this last session.